Hello, my name is Jaakko Mantujärvi, and this is an introduction to one of the most famous works of Western classical music, Spem in Alium. There are pieces of music which overwhelm you with their beauty. There are pieces of music which impress you with how cleverly they're made. And then there are pieces of music where the mind boggles at the sheer ambition of the composer. Spare Me in Alium by English composer Thomas Tallis was written 450 years ago, but continues to fascinate musicians and listeners alike to this day. It is a polyphonic piece of vocal music written for eight choirs of five parts each, for a total of 40 independent and separate parts, meaning that it requires at least 40 singers to perform. Much like the megalomaniac symphonies of Gustav Mahler, or, say, the opera cycle Licht by Karlheinz Stockhausen, Spem stands out as a monolith, dwarfing all the other wonderful music written at the same time, unique, unprecedented and unsurpassed. Also, we think. Later on, we'll find out that Spem did not come out of nowhere, and that it was not an isolated incident or a unique anomaly, as we might be tempted to imagine. The title, Spem in Alium, comes from the opening of the text of the piece. Spem in Alium nunquam habui preter in te Deus Israel, which translates word for word as, Hope in any other never did I have, except in thee, God of Israel. The title is sometimes misspelled Spem in Allium, which is very bad Latin for hope in garlic. In this video, I'll be taking a close look at Spem in Allium, specifically why it was written, how it was written, and what it actually contains. Now the what is fairly straightforward, as we have the score of the piece, we know exactly what it sounds like, and there are several fine recordings available. The why and the how are more complicated since we only have circumstantial evidence to rely on. But what we do have is enough to reconstruct a plausible story. So whether you're a choral music enthusiast, or whether you're just here because of Fifty Shades of Grey, follow along and we'll find out first of all why this magnificent beast came to be written in the first place. The 16th century was the height of the Renaissance in Western Europe. The arts were thriving. In music, this was the heyday of vocal polyphony, music for human voices, sometimes doubled with instruments, in independently moving parts that come together to produce a harmonious whole. This is an art form that had evolved over centuries in the service of the Catholic Church. And by this time, there had also evolved a genre of secular polyphony, mostly light-hearted love songs called madrigals. While sacred music was mostly the province of the church, a great deal of music, both sacred and secular, was commissioned by the wealthy upper classes. It was a point of pride for them to patronize the arts, and everybody who was anybody, be they royal or noble or wealthy merchant, was expected to have musicians and artists on call to elevate their everyday lives, sort of the Renaissance equivalent of owning a home theater system. There inevitably emerged a sort of competitiveness in putting on lavish entertainments to impress guests and to make the neighbors jealous. And indeed, it became a sort of arms race among the various royal courts and noble households as to who could put on the most extravagant extravaganza. Surviving documentation of banquets held by the Medici in Florence, for example, show just how ambitious these entertainments might be. Artists were always looking for new things to do, in search of what we would call the wow effect. Inevitably, this meant thinking big. <laughs> 
An ordinary piece of vocal polyphony might be written for, say, four, five, or six parts. And although pieces written for more voices than that were by no means exceptional even as much as a hundred years earlier, in the 16th century the idea of adding more and more voices to enrich the texture really took off. The most famous example of this is the Venetian polychoral style, which evolved due to the layout of the Basilica di San Marco in Venice. There the musicians were placed in the various lofts, creating what we would call a stereo or surround effect. The music written for this purpose could easily require 8, 10, 12 or 16 parts, but some composers went even further, envisioning music for 20 or 30 or 40 parts, truly extravagant numbers that must have produced an overwhelming effect for audiences at the time. There were many such composers in the late 16th century, but for the purposes of this story, we need to look at one Alessandro Strigio. Strigio was employed by the Medici in Florence, and he is credited with the invention of the madrigal comedy, a genre which combined the light-hearted secular music of madrigals with stage action, and which was one of the precursors of opera. Strigio's principal claim to fame lies in two sacred polyphonic pieces in 40 parts. The motet Ecce Beatum Lucem, written probably in 1561, and the mass setting Missa Sopra Ecco Si Beato Giorno, written probably in 1565 or 66. In 1567, Strigio arrived in London on a diplomatic mission that had taken him around Europe. The main point of this trip was to do publicity for the rising political importance of the Medici, which had been recently reinforced through the dynastic marriage of Francesco de' Medici to Johanna of Austria, from the Imperial House of Habsburg. And we know that Strigio had copies of his huge mass with him as proof of the importance of this marriage, since both these huge pieces had been performed in connection with the wedding. We also know from Strigio's correspondence that his specific intention in London was to meet, quote, the virtuosos in the profession of music that were there. Although we have no direct proof, it is a reasonable assumption that Strigio would have met Talis as the most prominent among these virtuosos, and it is more than likely that other mass would have been performed. Such a performance would have had to be in private, though, because Catholic religious observances were not tolerated in England at the time. This is important for reasons that we'll return to a bit later. So this is where Talis comes into the picture. The reasoning goes that he was inspired by the megalomania creations of Strigio to have a go himself. And the closest thing we have to a primary source verifying this is an anecdote recorded by a law student named Thomas Wateridge in 1611. I'll simplify his text a bit. In Queen Elizabeth's time, an Italian song was sent to England in 30 parts which made a heavenly harmony. The Duke of Blank, being a great music lover, asked, Could not any of our Englishmen set as good a song? And he said it like that because it was the 16th century and everyone talked like Shakespeare. And Talis, being very skillful, made one of 40 parts, which was sung in the long gallery at Arundel House, which so far surpassed the other that the Duke, hearing the song, took his chain of gold from his neck and put it about Talis's neck and gave it to him. You'll notice that he said 30 and not 40, but it's not entirely clear whether that was a misprint for 40, or whether he was talking about the Strigio, or about something else entirely. But as I said, this is the closest thing we have to a primary source. Thomas Wateridge was being extraordinarily coy in referring to the Duke of Blank, because at the time there was only one Duke in England, Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk. This gives us a range of dates within which Spearmin Allium must have been written. Strigio visited London in 1567, and the Duke of Norfolk was executed and his title discontinued in 1572, for reasons that we'll come back to later. The mention of Spam being performed at Arundel House ties in quite neatly, because Henry Fitzalan, the Earl of Arundel, was the son-in-law of the Duke of Norfolk, and Arundel House was his London home. 
Arundel House no longer exists, but it used to be located where we now find Arundel Street. In a very desirable location by the river in the heart of expanding London and within shouting distance of St. Paul's Cathedral, if you had a very strong pair of lungs. But wait, there's more. Spem may also have been performed at another property of the Earl of Arundel. He had a little place in the country named Nonsuch Palace, and a catalogue of the household possessions at Nonsuch Palace lists a copy of Spem. Even better, there was an octagonal dining hall there that would have been ideal for the eight choirs required for Spem. Nonsuch Palace is also long gone, but the name survives in Nonsuch Park, in the village of Cheam, in what is now the borough of Sutton in South London. We should note that the building was named Nonsuch Palace because King Henry VIII had it built so lavishly that there was supposed to be none such palace anywhere else in the world. In other words, it was not because the Earl of Arundel was trying to dodge taxes by pretending that the place didn't exist. So we can fairly reliably conclude that Spemin Alium came about because Thomas Tallis saw, or perhaps heard, the 40-part pieces that Alessandro Strigio brought with him to London in 1567, and was inspired to write his own. Whether this would have been a gesture of appreciation from one craftsman to another, or an assertion of the artistic supremacy of England, we will never know. And now, this. all very neat and tidy, but in this scenario there's still a slight problem. A problem that, among other things, raises speculation about a conspiracy theory. The problem is with the text that Talis chose for this magnum opus. We'll get to the precise content of the text in a minute, but for now let's just look at the fact that it's a text in Latin and it is taken from the Sarum Rite, an English variant of the Catholic liturgy. This had been superseded by the services in English enshrined in the Book of Common Prayer in 1549, almost 20 years before Strigio ever arrived in London. It isn't much of a stretch of the imagination to think that Talis may well have regarded Spem as his crowning achievement. After all, he was a venerable and prominent musician in his early 60s and at the pinnacle of his career. Surely it would have been in his interests to have this crowning achievement widely recognized then why select a text that would have made the very existence of this piece at best controversial and at worst downright dangerous? The religious history of England in the 16th century is complicated, with the monarchy going from Catholic to Catholic separationist to Protestant to Catholic who persecuted Protestants two Protestants who persecuted Catholics. So by the time Queen Elizabeth was crowned, you might be forgiven for being a bit paranoid about whether your religious practices would earn you a welcome at court or being burned at the stake. But there were some who managed to navigate these troubled times successfully. Talis was a Catholic throughout his life, and his pupil and colleague William Byrd actually converted from Protestant to Catholic during Queen Elizabeth's reign but they both not only avoided persecution, but positively flourished, being among the most prominent musicians of their time. They both wrote sacred music in English for Protestant services and in Latin for Catholic services, and in 1575, Queen Elizabeth granted them jointly a monopoly to print music for 21 years. This still begs the question of why Talis would choose an obscure paraphrase of a passage from the apocryphal book of Judith, rather than something generically festive like a Te Deum, or even an allegorical celebration of Queen Elizabeth. After all, an alternative theory about the origin of Spem is that it was written for the 40th birthday of Queen Elizabeth in 1573, which is not necessarily mutually exclusive with the story we went through earlier. Here is where we enter the realm of conspiracy theory. There's no mystery about the conspiracy itself, though. There was an actual plot by subversive Catholics to assassinate Elizabeth and to end the Protestant monarchy. This conspiracy is known as the Ridolfi Plot, named after Roberto Ridolfi, 
a Florentine nobleman who was its instigator and fundraiser. Catholics in England considered Elizabeth to be an illegitimate child of King Henry VIII, and therefore also an illegitimate monarch, besides being a Protestant heretic. The Ridolfi plot was headed by the Duke of Norfolk, whom we met earlier, and its purpose was simply to get rid of Elizabeth and to put Mary Stuart, Queen of Scotland, on the throne instead. Now, Mary Stuart wasn't exactly a saint herself, as she'd been married multiple times and engaged in questionable political dealings, but she did have a legitimate claim to the throne of England, and by this time, nearly 20 years into Elizabeth's reign, the Catholic rebels must have come to the conclusion that they'd rather have anyone but the orange-haired bastard. The idea was that the Duke of Norfolk would marry Mary Stuart, and that they would rule over England once Elizabeth had been assassinated. Even the Pope was okay with that, by the way. So how does Talus fit into all this? Well, as I said, the text of Spen is based on a passage in the Book of Judith. In the Book of Judith, Israel is under attack by the Assyrians, led by their general Horphernes. After 40 days of being under siege, Judith pretends surrender in order to gain access to Holofernes' household, and after Holofernes gets drunk one evening, she cuts off his head and thereby defeats the Assyrians. The text of Spem is a paraphrase of Judith's prayer immediately before she infiltrates Holofernes' household. So the theory is that Spem was conceived as part of a ritual for the conspirators to cleanse themselves before their venture. The fact that Spem is reported to have been performed at Arundel House lends some support to this conjecture, because the Earl of Arundel, also a Catholic, was sympathetic to the cause and, as we have seen, the son-in-law and a close friend of the Duke of Norfolk. Well, the Ridolfi plot was exposed, Ridolfi himself never returned to England, and the Duke of Norfolk was arrested and convicted of treason and executed. The Earl of Arundel was not directly involved in the plot, and thus escaped prosecution and punishment, but as a prominent Catholic, he was under perpetual suspicion thereafter. And what about Talis? If all this is true, then he must have been at least aware of the plot, even if he was not directly involved. We have no proof that Talis was involved in the Ridolfi plot in any way, shape or form, but it is an intriguing notion, and as Giordano Bruno once said, if it isn't true, then it's certainly very well invented. Next, let's talk about how Thomas Tallis managed to achieve this huge task that he had set himself. So, how do you solve a problem like a 40-part motet? Imagine listening to 40 people talking, all at once. <laughs> Chaos. Now imagine listening to 40 people singing, all at once. While you can easily hear that they're in harmony, how can you possibly make out what each of the individual 40 singers is doing? Well, the short answer is you can't. No one can. It's just not psychoacoustically possible to keep track of so many simultaneous events, no matter how good a listener you may be. But this was never really the point with these gargantuan pieces. It was more a question of composers and musicians exploring space as a musical element. Let's look at one of the immediate predecessors of Spem, namely Alessandro Strigio's motet Ece Beatam Lucem. The way that this is laid out shows clearly that Strigio operates with blocks of voices. He starts with a block of eight voices, followed by a block of ten voices, and then a more massive moment with 16 voices, and so on. The original manuscript doesn't bear any indication of divisions into choirs, and we don't even know how the performers are supposed to be located in the space. Our best guess is a wide semicircle, because every singer had to be in contact with the singer next to them, because of the different ways in which Strigio used the block groupings in the piece. And because of how the music is designed, there's no need for the extremities to be in close contact. Also, there are 13 parts that have a much more active role than the others, and in order to produce the desired effect, they would have to be more or less separate from each other. <laughs> 
Spem, on the other hand, is specifically written for eight choirs of five voices each. By their ranges, we would today call these voices soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, and bass. It is fairly clear from the way the piece is laid out that Talis intended it to be performed with the singers completely surrounding the audience. We'll look at this in detail a bit later. So, having understood as a listener that it isn't humanly possible to comprehend 40 voices going on all at once, the next question is, of course, how can a composer envision 40 voices going on all at once? The answer here is, of course, that they can't. For someone to conceive a 40-part piece in their head and then just write it out would be superhuman. Because of the spatial aspect I mentioned just now, it is very likely that a composer planning a work of such massive proportions would think about it first in terms of the placement of the voice groups, or, to borrow a term from architecture, the massing of the piece. There is no surviving source for Spem in Talis's own hand, so any discussion of how he may have approached this project can only be speculative. But we can make a few educated guesses. Today, choral singers are used to singing from full scores that show all the parts, as in this score of a simple four-part motet also by Talis. But in his day, in the 16th century, performers would have had separate part books showing only their own part and none of the others. Incidentally, instrumental players even today play from parts rather than scores. Composing a new piece by writing out the parts separately instead of in a score format is no problem if you are used to it and if the piece has a manageable number of parts, like the four parts in the previous example. But with 40 parts, this becomes pretty much impossible. So we must assume that Talis had some sort of framework sketch to work with when laying out the piece. Perhaps something like this diagram. I'll return to this in detail later, in the final section of this video, but for now, you can clearly see that although there are 40 parts in the piece, running from left to right, not everyone sings at the same time all the time. In fact, most of the singers involved spend quite long times not doing anything. The modern printed score of Spem looks like this, with each of the 40 parts on a separate staff running throughout the piece. Now, it may be tempting to imagine 40 Elizabethan singers holding these newspaper-sized scores at the first performance, but in reality it wouldn't have been anything like that. For one thing, paper was expensive, so there was a tendency to economise as far as possible, hence the practice of using part books. But it also seems unlikely that the performers of Spem would have had individual part books to sing from, or even choir books. This seems unlikely because of the very long pauses that the singers have in the course of the piece, and since they would be unable to see what was going on elsewhere, it would be extremely difficult and risky to attempt to just count out the pauses and hope that you count it right and come in at the right time. So the best educated guess we can make is that each performer had a part book containing all of the instances of their particular voice part. Each of the eight soprano singers would have had a part book containing the eight soprano parts, and so on. If we translate this into the diagram that I showed you just now, the soprano part book would look like this. As we can see, this would allow everyone to keep track of the progress of the piece while giving them a much more manageable stack of paper to sing from. There is some evidence to support this educated guess. The earliest surviving source for Spem is a manuscript copy made in about 1610, known as Edgerton Manuscript No. 3512 in the British Library. This copy was made at a time when the piece was used in festivities to honour the sons of King James I, Henry and Charles. The copy is fitted with a text in English to that effect, and the original Latin text is only given in a footnote. You can pause the next frame to read the English text, although it's not terribly inspiring. The copy of Spem in Edgerton Manuscript No. 3512 is laid out in score format, but with the voice parts grouped so that at the top you have the eight soprano parts, corresponding to the idea of a part book for eight similar voice parts. Well, that's all very well, but you may be asking yourself, if there are 40 independent parts, do they all have to be on different notes all the time? Well, that's not even theoretically possible. So what Tellus did in the massive 40-part moments in Spem was what we might describe as orchestration, balancing the sound of the texture by carefully chosen doubling. Let's look at just one example of this, 
the very last chord in the piece. If you write it out on a piano staff, it looks like this, a G major chord in several octaves. But instead of distributing the voices equally across this chord, Talis put the greatest emphasis here, in the mid-range, with a total of 17 voices on the triad in this octave. Next, for added brightness, is the octave above, with a total of 12 voices on the triad in this octave. And at the very top, only two voices on the top G, because that's really all you need. It's going to be heard anyway. More interestingly, there are only three voices on the lowest root note, because all the pitches above also reinforce the pitches in the lowest triad. To be honest, it's all conjecture and imagination when we try to figure out how Talis set about the task of composing Spem. We're on much firmer ground when we look at the piece itself, when we explore exactly what Talis achieved and how you can follow what's going on. I have performed SPEM 10 times in the past 14 years. I find it fascinating how the piece operates on so many different levels. You can just let the sound wash over you as the music circulates in the space. Or, if you happen to be sitting close to some other performers, or indeed performing the piece yourself, you can marvel at the intricate detail that Talis has worked into every one of the 40 parts. Since the score looks like this, I can't very well use it as a demonstration aid, because you wouldn't be able to see what I'm talking about if I say, for instance, that this is the most dangerous note in the entire piece. So let's go back to the diagram I showed you earlier. Now before we start, I need to point out something that I've sort of hinted at with the colours here. You can see from this diagram that the choirs almost always work in pairs. Choirs 1 and 2 operate together, and so on. So, although it's laid out as a piece for eight choirs of five parts, it's really more of a piece for four choirs of ten parts, and this structure becomes apparent when we get into the music bouncing around between choirs on opposite sides of the space. Also, remember when I said that it's highly likely that Talis would have regarded this work as his crowning achievement? Well, it would appear that he worked his signature into the piece through a bit of numerological encoding. When we add up the numerical values of the letters in the name Talis, we get 69. And as it happens, the length of Spem is exactly 69 longs. In modern musical notation, we're used to thinking of this note value as the longest one that there is, which is why it's called a whole note. But the old name for this note value, which is still used in the UK, is a semibrieve which comes from the Latin brevis for short and semi for half. So what we call a whole note was originally half of a short note. So two whole notes make a breve, which looks like this. And as you might guess, two breves make one long. The piece begins with the music flowing gradually from choir one all the way to choir eight. The first half of the first phrase is stated by choirs 1 to 4, and the second half by choirs 5 to 8. Then comes the first point where all 40 voices join in. This occurs with numerological precision at measure 40, out of the total of 138. Didn't I just say that the length of the piece was 69? Yes, it is 69 long measures, or 138 short measures. Both measure numbering schemes are used on the Edgerton manuscript copy, so it's a reasonable assumption that the measures were originally numbered like that as well. Anyway, after measure 40, we go back from choir 8 to choir 1, and then there's a lovely moment where choirs 1 and 2 introduce the text Et Omnia Peccata Hominum, which is followed by the second entry of all 40 voices. This is obviously a bit of word painting, with all the voices coming in on the word Omnia, all. This occurs at measure 69, exactly halfway through the piece. Then, the music stops. There's a sudden break where all the voices fall silent. Somehow this is one of the most startling effects in the piece, and it happens three times in all. <laughs> 
After this brief journey, we arrive at the passage where Talis pits opposing choirs against each other on multiple repetitions of the text Domine Deus, Creator Celi et Terre. This builds up energy until the music suddenly stops again. And this pause is followed by the most extraordinary moment in the entire piece. We've ended up at C major at this point, but after the pause, all 40 voices enter on an unrelated A major chord on the first statement of the word respice from the last bit of the text. Now, this chord begins on the last beat of measure 108, but the chord continues into measure 109, and I'm going to go out on a numerological limb here and suggest that the previous entries of all voices are relevant for this one, since 40 plus 69 equals 109. A short run through all the choirs is followed by the third pause, after which all voices enter again on the word respice in measure 122 and continue to the end in a wash of sound that eventually settles on G major for the blazing conclusion. Spem in Alium stands out as one of the true masterpieces of Renaissance polyphony. It is hardly surprising that it has inspired 40 part tributes by composers in our own time as well, such as Giles Swain, Anthony Pitts, James Lavino, Peter Magar, and also myself. But that's a story for another time. Now, history and theory can be interesting, but a piece of music doesn't really exist unless it's performed and listened to. So we're going to finish this introduction by listening to the entire piece from beginning to end. Thank you so much for joining me on this excursion. And here, finally, is Spermin Alium. <laughs>